think we'll begin. Um, a good afternoon to everyone who's joined us for the post-budget debate, um, which comes almost a week after the Minister of Finance, Tito Mbweweni, delivered the supplementary budget speech on the 24th of June, 2020. The speech was delivered in a context where the government's neoliberal macroeconomic policy framework, even before COVID-19 laid bare a breeding ground since the gear years for rising unemployment, which is now, based on the narrow definition officially, above 30%. Increasing socioeconomic inequality and high debt servicing costs at the expense of real investment in the economy. Treasury, together with the economic cluster, are at the center of driving what can be described as a neoliberal and orthodox macroeconomic policy framework. And it is on this basis that about 34 economists as signatories of a letter published on the business day are appealing for a greater role of the South African Reserve Bank for a post COVID-19 economic recovery. And I'd like to quote uh, a piece from the letter. Our starting point in that discussion is that the entire macroeconomic framework is defunct and has to be dispensed with, or we risk degenerating into a failed economy, society and state. Close quote. To begin with, I would like to first introduce myself. I am Sikolu Tango. I am a public policy analyst and a labor relations and economy program manager at the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. Um, we are based here in the Southern, Southern African office. The Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung is a German global democratic socialist foundation and is hosting this webinar with the Alternative Information and Development Center, which is an activist think tank that was established in 1996 to support and work with social movements and trade unions for a wage-led and low carbon development path. The event is also co-hosted together with our media partner, The Mail and Guardian, um, which has, uh, was shown to be South Africa's most trusted weekly by the Reuters Journalism Institute of the Oxford University. I would then also like to proceed to first welcome the panel by first introducing the honorable guest speaker for this afternoon, the Deputy Minister of Finance, Dr. David Masondo. Um, Dr. David Masondo is also an African National Congress National Executive Committee member serving in the Economic Transformation Committee and has served in various positions of leadership. The Honorable Deputy Minister has been allocated 20 minutes to contextualize the budget speech delivered by the Finance Minister, his colleague, last week. The second panelist is Busi Sibeko. Busi is a researcher and economist at the Institute for Economic Justice where her research focuses macroeconomic policy, including tax justice, fiscal and monetary policy, and participatory budgeting to advance social economic rights. Busi also sits on the steering committee of the Budget Justice Coalition and also provides research support to the Labour constituency. Busi will highlight key aspects of the budget for commentary based on the Deputy Minister's presentation and will be allocated 10 minutes. The third panelist is Professor Malikana, who is an associate professor at a Witts School of Economics and Finance. Prof Malikana will unpack what more the South African Reserve Bank can do to support productive economic activity. At the heart of this matter also lies the question about what the legal constraints of doing so are. Prof Malikana is also allocated 10 minutes. And finally, the discussion, as you know, this is a post-budget debate, will be structured um, where the discussants will have an opportunity um, following the 30-minute presentation by the panelists. And they will be first given five minutes each to directly um, comment or question um, the Honorable Deputy Minister, who's our guest speaker. Um, the first discussant who I'll be introducing is Dr. Dick Forslund. Dr. Dick Forslund is a socialist economist who has contributed to the activist think tank AIDC as a researcher, educator, and trade union assistant. The second uh, discussant is Dr. Duma Kobule. Duma Kobula is an economist and former financial journalist. Um, he is also the founding director at the Center for Economic Development and Transformation. The third discussant is Reg Nkosi. Reg is the executive director of Fit Source Money and Public Banking South Africa, 
a research and advisory organization that specializes in macroeconomics, money, banking, and development economics. Finally, I would like to welcome all the participants um, who have joined us today for the webinar. Um, and I will now hand over to Busu Sibeko. Um, I thought uh, Mr. Masondo was going first. No, oh, excuse me, sorry, Mr. Masondo, <laughs> please do go first. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, Siko. You know, when the poster was uh, circulating to advertise this event, uh, people were saying, Yo, you're going to be eaten alive there. Where are you going? <laughs> and, and my response was that as public representatives, we do need to engage everyone in society, regardless of what we think of their uh, ideas. So I'm ready to be eaten alive. I'm, I'm your lunch uh, uh, today. This is what I, I've signed for as a, as a public representative. And one thing I considered to some of the people who were commenting was that uh, it's the, the panel, you should have had someone who will put a different view and all that. And I said, look, I think that's the problem generally in South Africa, both on the right and the left. The way we constitute our panels, uh, they, they tend not to be very uh, diverse because I've attended other debates in which the, the thinking was by and large more, the, more or less the same. Uh, so I'm sure at some point we'll find a way of uh, diversifying uh, our, our panels, both sides. I'm, I'm not... Uh, um, so the second point I want to make, uh, Siko, uh, the, the minister was not happy with the first advert in which you put this picture. And I said, am I do too, that ugly that you could not put my picture? Uh, you had to find... <laughs> the post of the minister, he, he felt that uh, it was not with his consent and it was a misleading advert and we should not do it again. Um, so <clears throat> my assumption is that uh, I'm going to assume that uh, you, everyone who's listening here has read the budget speech and I'm here for discussions, for debate. And if I to be eaten alive, that's okay. I hope I'll come out alive. Uh, I may temporarily die in this platform, but I will, I will still come out alive after it. So the way I've organized my uh, input is as follows. One, I'll just state why this uh, special adjustment budget and the context within which it is presented. And I think some of the points Siko has already taken my words and uh, state its context in terms content in terms of what it seeks to achieve. I'm not going to go into the detail because, like I said, I assume that everyone has read it. Before my 20 minutes, it's cut, it's finished. Let me summarize what my argument will be. The first thing I want to say in terms of my argument or what I'm saying in this uh, input <clears throat> is that uh, the fiscal policy is constrained. In fact, it was even constrained before this COVID, and it is even constrained in the current period of uh, COVID. However, other policy instruments which are outside the national treasury may have more space to make us breathe, and national treasury is not con in control of those policy instruments. For instance, the trade policy, we, we don't tell ITEC um, at what level should they reduce or increase the tariffs. Legally, they are responsible for the tariffs. The labor market policy, some of the changes that people want, there's a process, it depends on the net lag negotiations. We don't set wages as national treasury. That's the outcome of struggle between labor and, 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 and business and employers. So the, the expectations therefore of national treasury should be understood uh, within this context. However, we do need to look at the totality of the country's balance sheet uh, if we are to make more additional interventions to get out of the situation in which we find ourselves in. But the use of the current of the country's balance sheet 
should be used in such a manner that we don't blow up the assets in the same way as we've blown up the fiscus. And therefore, we need to think about the possible instruments, policy instruments that will enhance economic growth and development. And I must say that uh, some of these arguments that I, I'm going to present here are entailed in a working paper that I'm working on. I use this paper to engage different stakeholders to be thinking about uh, these issues. And I'm hoping that uh, this conversation will also help me to identify certain blind spots insofar as the certain things that we need to be thinking about. But I will publish the paper hopefully before the end of this week or early next week. Now, why? let's go to the first question, um, which was why this budget? We, we all know that this budget was occasioned by the outbreak of the COVID, which disrupted the incomes of different uh, economic agents, workers, business, including the state, because the tax revenue was hit by this uh, uh, COVID, and the workers have been losing their wages and businesses, the serious cash flow problems, which generated liquidity challenges. And our <clears throat> interventions was to make sure that the liquidity challenges, they don't eventually lead to the solvency, workers' wages, um, they get uh, protected in some ways. We might not have done enough to, to do so. And I'm sure we'll hear more from my colleagues uh, in this panel. And I think a lot of economists, they've summed it up the, the impact of COVID, they've summed it up in terms of its impact on the demand side and the supply side. And government's response uh, through, or go government has responded through fiscal and monetary policies. And there is, our response can be classified into three phases or we've classified our responses into three phases. The first phase was uh, largely to make sure that we stabilize the household's income, businesses' incomes. And um, the monetary policy, there have been different interventions, particularly in the second phase of our intervention, in which they cut the repo rate, buying bonds in the secondary market. And I think if you read the financial stability review, which they published in April, the Reserve Bank also indicated that they are ready, I'm quoting them here, uh, that open code, the Reserve Bank is, stands ready to take additional action should the need uh, arise. Now, the purpose of the uh, special budget was simply to get authorization from Parliament uh, on the 500 billion stabilization, which was already announced by government. As you know, we can't spend money without the permission of the legislature. So even ourselves as national treasury, we don't finally determine what goes where. It is parliament itself, which has a final decision uh, um, uh, uh, authority in so far as how we spend the money, how we tax people and all that. So the, the power that is usually ascribed to treasury, I sometimes feel that it's over-exaggerated because we don't, in the final analysis, determine the budget. And that is why even this budget, it's, uh, it's conversa I mean, the conversations are going on within parliament. Um, and it's in the final analysis, the parliament, which must say, OK, this budget, we approve it, um, and therefore go and spend. So the budget, at the risk of repeating myself, it's the parliament which eventually uh, take a decision on how we spend. Um, the, the, I think SICO has already laid out that this budget was presented against the context where you had uh, low economic growth, there was already technical recession, and this low economic growth, it's deepening. Uh, the first quarter results are out. The economy has declined by 2%. And the pre-COVID unemployment statistics are scaring. 
31% um, people are unemployed, essentially 10 million people. It's like the population of some of the countries, both in the global north and in the global south. So unemployment is deepening. Inequality is also deepening. We are one of the most unequal societies in the world. And public debt is increasing our projection. It's that um, the debt is going to increase by almost 4 trillion. And I think it's important for all of us to accept that uh, unemployment, low growth, the rise of the public debt, inequality, it's a symptom. In themselves, these indicators, they are not a problem themselves, but they are generated. And there have been different ways of understanding this problem. Some of the people, they understood them in technocratic ways that no, if you sort out the technical capacity of the state, these problems will go away. Um, this uh, technocratic way of looking at it, yes, it provides and prescribes certain specific policy remedies to restore the functionality of our economy. Um, but it has certain shortcomings, which is that it doesn't look at the systemic origins of the challenges that were facing unemployment, the rise of the public debt. But there's also a very populist way of understanding this problem, which is really about, no, this is crisis we're in. This is a result of the greedy business people, corrupt politicians. This is provide a moral story and provide a moral solution that get bad people in and get good people in. I don't deny the fact that you do have corrupt individuals within the state, within the economy, but it doesn't tell you about the structural roots of the challenge that we're basically facing. And of course, there is um, an anti-capitalist way of understanding this problem which gets into the root of the problem that we are facing, the intra-competition between business, which generate a lot of pathologies, which I'm not gonna get into now. So, and, but I think what we must also appreciate is that um, the, the Alliance government, we are united not to overthrow the capitalist system, but to transform it or reform it in such a way that it produces better economic uh, outcomes. And therefore, in doing so, investment is quite critical. The cost of uh, reducing the, uh, the, the uh, doing business in South Africa, it's critical, but also improving the living conditions of the poor. So we, we, we're not, as the alliance and, and, and as government seeking to overthrow the capitalist system. Our task is how particularly its colonial nature, how do we transform it in such a way that it produces better developmental outcomes. Um, so let me come back to the issue around the public debt. Having said that, uh, from the budget that the minister has presented, the special budget, like I said, we, we project that the public debt and like I said, the public debt is one of the problems. It's not the only problem that we are facing in South Africa. Public debt is one of those problems that we are facing. And like I said, four trillion uh, public debt that we have and the deficit is going to increase to almost a trillion, 770 billion. The debt service cause, when the minister was presenting the budget, he pointed out that uh, we're paying 230 billion. This was in February to service the debt. And I must indicate that borrowing in itself, it's not bad, but what are you borrowing for? And that's a point that I'm going to come back to. And I do think that it's important to contextualize the South African debt in its global context. There's a study recently produced, I think 2009, by the World Bank, is titled Global Waves of Debt, Causes and Consequences. It basically shows that from the 70s, um, the debt has been increasing. Um, the world debt today, it's um, 200 and something of the GDP. 
and this debt has been growing on from the 70s. You may disagree with the analytics of the World Bank on how the debt came about, but it is a fact. And it's very clear to me that the sources of this debt has to do with the falling profit rates from the 70s, in which a lot of companies, in trying to keep afloat, they've been borrowing a lot, and some of them they've shifted to the financial sector as a side to basically more money. Therefore, it's not by accident that you've seen a lot of financialization of our economy. The real wage has been declining, and it's, therefore, it's not by accident that a lot of workers have been indebted, borrowing money to finance their domestic or their private consumption. And uh, therefore, and, 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 and governments, by and large, the tax revenue have been declining, forcing government to basically borrow a lot. And the sources of debt vary according to a different country. I mean, for instance, in the US, the increase of the debt, it increased particularly in 2008. It increased not because there was a lot of expenditure, but of the bailouts that we've basically seen of the inefficient companies, GMs and the private banks. And in our case, the drivers of the debt is not as a result of the low economic growth only, but some of the SOEs that we've had, they've uh, we've been bailing them out and they've not been producing good results. And I'll come back to this point later, maybe during uh, discussions. The wage bill, corruption, wastage and irregular expenditure. And the debt itself, as it grows, it also means that we are also increasing the interest payment on the debt itself. And there's a tendency in the political left to trivialize the South African public debt and compare it to the global north and say, but look at America, look at Japan, their debt is so big. Why are we worried about our growing debt? And that's why we should, these, these are two reasons why we should worry about the growing public debt. Because the class nature of the debt, firstly, it shifts expenditure from infrastructure, meeting people's needs towards servicing the debt paying the lenders 230 billion that will basically pay for servicing this debt. And some people in the left, they say, no, you shouldn't worry anyway. This debt, it's, we are paying the rich, so we shouldn't be worried about the, the, the servicing of the debt. But this argument, in my view, it ignores the fact that lenders is not just the rich, but pension money as well. It's involved because when we go out as government and borrow money, we're also borrowing from the pension fund. And the, even that argument that no, it's, it's our money anyway, if we continue to borrow and we don't invest this money productively, the danger is that the poor may not in the finance analysis even have good retirement or their retirement, their pensions and all that. So if we don't think carefully about how we use this money, we may have serious problems in so far as the ability of government paying those. And I'm take the argument that no, not everyone will resign on the same day and so forth and so forth. But the point is that even those ones, if, if we blow up, this money is not invested in a manner that produce uh, good returns for these savers, we might have serious challenges. You just have to look at the VBS as an example in which, for instance, poor uh, workers, poor people in that part of uh, my province have lost their pensions and government could only pay so much and they've basically lost them. So I do think that uh, the fact that we've got this balance sheet, it doesn't mean that we need to invest it, uh, utilize it irresponsibly. I do take the argument that if we invest it productively, it will set very good conditions, even for the working class, the poor, to retire in better good infrastructure, better housing, and so forth and so forth. So I do think that uh, we need to take the argument on the usage of the pensions 
along the lines of making sure that these pensions are used towards the growth of the economy. Let me move towards closure because I think I've spoken a lot in terms of the solutions or proposals that are out there in the special budget insofar as how we basically think we should tackle the public debt. One, we say that we need to relook at the composition of the expenditure, including looking at how we finance some of the SOEs that we basically have. There are limits to the extent to which you can tax, and I'm glad that there's different proposals out there insofar as looking at solidarity tax, inherent tax, these are the things that we are debating and discussing within a government. And we are, in terms of dealing with the issue around financing, uh, our government, we are looking for cheap money, uh, but also guard against, including from the IMF, uh, the New Development Bank, but guard against the future exchange risk. It's for this reason that we are borrowing from the IMF, particularly for the COVID-related interventions in the context of looking for cheap money. And we're not oblivious to the potential risks insofar as the exchange rates are, are, are concerned. And if the Reserve Bank, in exercising their instrument independence without any influence from anyone decide to lend government money uh, or buy government bonds directly, we'll definitely welcome it. But we can't prescribe to them that they must do so. But as government in which we are looking for cheap money, everywhere, if the Reserve Bank decide to do so, we will definitely welcome it if they decide to do so without anyone's influence, exercising their own instrument independence. But we are not responsible for the monetary policy as national treasurer. If we were to get this money from all those sources, whether from tax, from borrowing, what should we be using this money for? We think that we should pay serious attention on growth enhancing activities, infrastructure, industries, industrialization, agriculture, and all that, because the best way of sustaining uh, uh, ourselves and also making sure that we don't end in the, at the door of the IMF is to grow our economy, use our balance sheet in such a way that we grow uh, our economy. And therefore, the money that we've got to get from all whatever sources, it must be directed towards uh, economic growth. And I want to submit that economic growth is also about restoring the profitability of enterprises um, in, 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 in this instance. And therefore, making sure that the production costs are lower, it's an important uh, 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 consideration in that regard. The infrastructures dealing with the, the network industries is an important equation in that regard. And of course, there's different ways of restoring profitability. You can draw it in such a way that it worsens the conditions of the poor, or you can do it in such a way that uh, you still improve the conditions of the, of, of the poor. I mean, Sweden is one example in which the recovery after the Second World War, the profitability was done in such a way that the living conditions of the poor, the welfare state, and so forth and so forth. But profitability was at the center of how the recovery was being done. Let me rest my case here, and I'm ready to be eaten alive. Thank you, uh, Siko. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Minister. Um, we won't eat you alive, um, Minister, and we appreciate the platform for engagement. I think this is the platform we've created. Um, I want to go to Busi next, and um, we we'll see the minister mentioned that uh, there, there's a need for policy instruments that will enhance growth and development. Perhaps you can reflect based on the budget speech that uh, Dita Mboweni delivered and the Honorable Minister um, a speech right now, what uh, growth and development means to you. And um, yes, thanks. Thanks, Busi. 
Hi, um, thank you, Mr. Masonda, for those um, opening remarks. I'm just going to share my slides here, um, and I hope you'll be able to see them. Um, I just want to start off by saying that I, I completely agree that there is structural reform needed in South Africa. I'm not sure I completely agree with the structural reform that the National Treasury is proposing, particularly when we reflect on the growth strategy that was released last year and that the National Treasury insists on implementing going forward. But I will not engage in those larger discussions about SOEs and everything like that because I think it's very important that we talk about this current moment because how we've responded to the, to the COVID crisis is going to inform our way forward and how we are able to recover from here. I think the high level analysis, I would like to say that the budget has showed little understanding of the state's constitutional obligations. And I'll go through this later on about how we aren't doing enough uh, for health and that we are moving money away from long term development in education in particular, as an example, and transport, um, which are very important for socioeconomic uh, progression. I think as well, we need to talk about how the um, government has defaulted on their promise of an economic relief package. What was announced was a 500 billion package, but what we are seeing actually in the budget is a net increase of 36 billion um, to the, the fiscus that was announced in, in February budget. So that is certainly not what we were expecting and that a lot of cuts have been made to the allocations that were originally promised. And I'll go again deep into that. And I think it's important to, to acknowledge that this is happening in the context of austerity. And I know Mr. Masondo will not agree with me on this, uh, but the numbers do show that we have had austerity in the past. The budget, yes, has expanded, but really what it has expanded towards is debt servicing costs and not non-interest expenditure, which is what we are really deeply concerned about. So my high level summary of the supplementary budget, it was that most of the relief, first of all, is off the budget, it's off budget expenditure. So it's not actually on the budget. And I'll break this down. And there were major cuts, as I mentioned, transport 4.6 billion, 10 billion being cut from tertiary um, sector, which is very concerning because how do you build your future when you cut at the investments that are meant to help you in the long run? Of course, again, basic education was a net loser. Um, again, and they are obviously shouldering um, some of the burdens of COVID right now. There was no mention of gender-based violence, which is concerning. Continuously, we've raised this, that we need a gender-responsive budget in South Africa. We were one of the first countries in the world to pioneer gender-responsive budgeting, yet here we are in 2020, and we have completely lost way in terms of that. And I've already mentioned that the net increase is 36 billion, and that the concern is that some of the relief is actually for the medium term, which does not define what a relief package is. A relief package is supposed to be in the immediate term to help preserve the economy. And I see that the National Treasury said that the attempt was to preserve the economy, but I'd argue that this budget does not do that. So first of all, in terms of health, 20 billion was allocated um, and the budget allocation is slightly higher. Um, but most of this money that's being allocated to health is actually reprioritization. And the concern there is that we are reallocating funds um, from longer term development, for instance, infrastructure for hospitals and clinics. And what we're doing is we're building field hospitals, which after the COVID crisis, we will no longer need, which means we are borrowing or taking away from long term development again. And just to mention that we are in the middle of a health crisis and pandemic, but the net increase for health is 2.9 billion. Um, which is very concerning because that's very little for the amount that we need. We could have done more. In fact, this entire budget should have taken where we are and done even more, not taken away from a budget that was already uh, being cut over the medium term at about 48 billion. In terms of the social grants, 50 billion was allocated in the announcement, but what we see in the budget is 41 billion. Um, certainly, we know that the scale of need in this country is not 41 billion. Already as civil society, we said that 50 billion was not enough, and now we are at 41 billion. And of course, I won't pin this on Treasury because implementation is not their problem, but we are deeply concerned about how this money has been implemented and excluded millions of people who desperately need it, which means, of course, this is going to have impact on our larger economic uh, performance. But again, a lot of that money is reallocated from the social grants um, existing budget. 
In terms of municipalities, we are very concerned about the equitable share. Um, we understand that municipalities are on the front line of dealing with COVID crisis, yet the money that's being allocated surely is not enough. We are seeing in the Eastern Cape how the health is collapsing, um, healthcare sector is collapsing, but we also need to know how municipalities are meant to deal with this and the funding that they need to be able to adequately deal with this. In terms of job creation and protection, this was probably one of the most shocking because 100 billion was allocated um, to this fund. But what has happened is that only 6.1 billion is being allocated for this year. Again, a, a, a relief package cannot be implemented in the medium term. In fact, we needed that 100 billion yesterday and we need it today because it's been 100 days since lockdown began. And what we haven't done is we haven't spent enough um, to be able to deal with the crisis. The off-budget support, which I feel that, in a way, Treasury can't really claim, include wage support. Um, and we are concerned there that less than 30% of the workforce has been able to you know, access this, whereas 60% of the budget has already been used. And the reason why I put this here is because we need to understand the scale of need. So when we reflect on the social grants and reflect on this wage support, does it make sense for this current moment? Does it support people's livelihoods for the current moment? In terms of tax relief, um, we're concerned about the uptake has been really low, but again, this is a deferral. It doesn't mean that the, the tax won't happen in the future. In terms of the emergency response, again, low uptake, which is concerning because again, businesses hire people, businesses are the job creators. And so if they're not um, tapping into these funds, which we've heard from numerous people that are really difficult to get loans for, it means that people are likely to lose their jobs. And again, what is the budget going to do to ensure that people are, are protected? So just to say that, again, we were talking about the first part of my presentation was really about the current moment we are not doing enough. And in fact, the stimulus that we are saying we're inputting is less than 1% of um, GDP, although we are claiming that the response package is 10% of GDP. Again, we know that our growth is going to be lower by about approximately 7%. So this is not nearly enough to deal with that drop off. What this budget has become, though, in the context of austerity and in the spirit of austerity, which is cutting budgets to deal with debt, we're seeing a continuation in this. We're introducing zero-based budgeting, um, which I can go into, you know, all the positives and negatives of it. But what I really want to highlight here is that what zero-based budgeting is going to do in this context is accelerate austerity. As the, the um, Tito Mboweni already said, that they're aiming for 230 billion surplus over the next two years, which is concerning because we know that zero-based budgeting will not be implemented in its truest form, which is to say what are the needs and what are the projects that need to be implemented, but rather it's going to be implemented as a way to cut expenditure and cut programs. And I also want to say that zero-based budgeting cannot solve our fiscal distress. Um, and there's many ways that it will not solve our fiscal distress, including this idea that it will cut wasteful expenditure. Yes, some projects will go, but we have to acknowledge that in South Africa, there are many high performing corrupt programs and that zero based budgeting will not be able to wean those off because again, um, it is actually the failure of our government completely um, that we are here, right? The, the failure to justify programs, the failure to ensure that cost is efficient, the failure to ensure that projects are um, actually functioning in the way that they should and wasteful expenditure is um, dealt with. And I'm really concerned about why is your based budgeting being introduced now in the midst of a crisis, whereas all these other years we've been going along and haven't really dealt with this decisively. But I want to say lastly, this is my second last slide, to say that what we know about austerity, cutting budgets, um, spend as a way of dealing with debt, is that it leads to declining GDP growth, it increases debt to GDP ratio, it increases unemployment, it results in falling incomes, and it results in increasing inequality. And I think this is very important to say that the most marginalized groups in society, which includes women, children, minorities, migrants, and the poor, are the ones who feel the biggest impacts. Already with zero-based budgeting, we will see that people are going to be punished for government's inability to deliver at the local government level, at the provincial government level, and at the national level. The people who shoulder the costs of zero-based budgeting are those that the projects are supposed to benefit, um, but we're going to be taking these away from them. And again, the, the, the argument against austerity is simple, and we are accelerating austerity. We are saying that we're going to continue cutting spend over the ne next two years while we are in a crisis, as we know that austerity is self-defeating during 
recessionary times because obviously the, there's a weak demand and there's depressed economy and there's shrinking private sector expenditure. Um, and we know that cutting all these, cutting spend really, I, I think sometimes I have to go back and remind people that, you know, GDP, the calculation of GDP includes government expenditure. And that's, this doesn't mean that we should just spend aimlessly, but it means that we need to consider how our spend is part of the GDP equation and how spend itself can trigger or rather can have economic multipliers that improve our economy, that invest in the areas that we need to invest in. We cannot wait for private sector to come and invest um, in some of these areas, transport, um, education, tertiary education, which we are already cutting in the national budget. And that's the role of the budget, um, to really cater to what South Africa needs and to really play a developmental role that leads us to that place. That's all for me. Thank you so much, Busi. Um, I'll now hand over to Professor Malikana. Um, Professor, the, the Deputy Minister mentioned that there is nothing inherently wrong with borrowing. Can you expand on this, especially with regards to the, uh, the question of the independence of, of the South African Reserve Bank and, and what role it has in, in, in changing um, the macroeconomic policy framework? Thank you, Seiko, and thank you to my fellow panelists, discussants, and the to the Deputy Minister, thanks for engaging us. Um, I have here in front of me the Constitution, uh, which describes the roles and functions of the Reserve Bank. If I may read quickly, it says that the primary object of the South African Reserve Bank is to protect the value of the currency in the interest of balanced and sustainable economic growth in the Republic. Uh, the South African Reserve Bank, in pursuit of its primary object, must perform its functions independently without and without fear, favor or prejudice. Um, but there must be regular consultation between the bank and the cabinet member responsible for national financial matters. So the issue of the independence of the Reserve Bank is only in relation to the instruments that it chooses in pursuit of the primary object, which is monetary policy. All the other functions of the Reserve Bank, the Reserve Bank is not independent. So we need to be very clear that the independence of the Reserve Bank is very much constrained to the choice of instruments to implement monetary policy. The Reserve Bank uh, is not independent to choose its own policy because the policy is set by the Minister of Finance. So the role of the Reserve Bank really is an implementation arm on behalf of uh, the Minister of Finance. So just to, 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 to say to the Minister of Finance that actually they, they wield a lot of power over the, of the, over the central bank. They have a lot of power and they, because they can give a mandate and provide uh, objectives uh, to the central bank to, to pursue. As to how the central bank, the particular instruments it chooses to in pursuance of those mandates, it's up to the reserve bank, but the mandate comes from, from government. Now, briefly, uh, in relation to what we are discussing, the, the prominent function of the Reserve Bank that is of uh, interest to us is the monetary policy function. Um, and, 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 and secondly, the other function, the Reserve Bank is a banker of government. These two functions are relevant in our discussion of the, of the budget. Now, let me start with the monetary policy function. We have been made to believe that the monetary policy has to do with just setting interest rates and targeting inflation and stabilizing fluctuations around a trend of the economy. But actually, monetary policy is broader than that. It's about regulating credit conditions, you know, regulating credit conditions to ensure stable prices and full employment of national resources. That is monetary policy uh, broadly defined. Uh, Interest rate setting, or what you call inflation targeting, is just one aspect of monetary policy. So there's a broad field of action that the central bank should be playing in ensuring that credit conditions uh, are, are, are developed to ensure full utilization of national resources, but at the same time maintaining um, stable prices. Now, 
what is interesting also about the central bank is that is the is the is the bank of government. You know, as a banker of government, its role is to advise government on macroeconomic policy, it's not to set macroeconomic policy, but to advise government on macroeconomic policy, particularly on how to finance the deficit. You know, so in my view, uh, I was quite shocked that when the governor mentioned that uh, he is not concerned about uh, fiscal sustainability, you know, in a lecture that he delivered in at, at VETS in the previous week. Yet we know that one of the crucial factors that drive the evolution of public debt is the interest cost, as the deputy minister has mentioned, and the, the interest rate that is charged in financial market is under the control of the, of the central bank. And the second point as a bank of government, the central bank should be directly financing government. And uh, uh, it's in the law, legally, the central bank is allowed to finance government. And in this instance, I would like to draw the attention of the deputy minister to the point that, in fact, it is not up to the, cent the central bank, the sub, to offer government loans or to offer to buy government bonds. It's up to government to actually approach the sub and ask uh, the sub to take on directly some of the bonds or to give some of the loans. And there are limits to what the sub can do in relation to that. So it's up to government really to choose whether they want to go to the sub or they want to go to the open financial markets or they want to go to the IMF. So, the, so, so it's up to, up, up to the national treasury in that regard. And the third point is that uh, national treasury um, has the power to change the, the act that governs the reserve bank. You see, so so the so the law that governs the Reserve Bank is coming from the Minister of Finance, you know, who then proposes the law to Parliament for Parliament to ratify it as the legislature. So the Reserve Bank is actually operating within the law as set by the Minister of Finance. So if the Minister of Finance is of the view that the SAP has to do more than it is doing now, then the power is rests with the Minister of Finance to change the law. And, and to propose the law to be um, changed in, in, in Parliament. And also the, 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 the SAP has to make sure that, you know, when government goes out to borrow, financial conditions are set in such a way that borrowing is not costly. So as matters stand, um, uh, 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 the yield on the long-term government bonds is in excess of 9%. Economic growth, is estimated to be minus 2%, you know, and uh, it's going to be negative for quite some time in my, in my view. Yet, the yield, you know, the interest rate on long-term government bonds still remains elevated. To go to the open market under those conditions is, in my view, um, fiscal suicide. So that's where now the Reserve Bank, together with National Treasury, have to sit down in what economists call fiscal and monetary coordination, right? Inflation is low, so there's space for the sub to coordinate a, a monetary policy in such a way as to allow space for fiscal policy, expansionary fiscal policy to be, to be undertaken. So um, when we talk about fiscal and monetary coordination, uh, and when the constitution says that uh, the Reserve Bank should, uh, should, should perform its primary mandate in regular consultation with the Minister of, of Finance, for example, uh, that must be taken to mean that in setting its interest rates or in conducting its monetary policy, the Reserve Bank, together with, this, with the National Treasury, have to sit down and craft a strategy to ensure that fiscal policy is not too costly to the taxpayer, you know, it can't be that the, the, the sub independently, right, decides to say, no, we are going to raise interest rates or lower interest rates without regard to what is going to happen to public debt. Because as matters stand now, the 230 billion that um, the Deputy Minister of Finance is talking about, is coming from interest payments. And who's responsible for, for setting interest rates? 
And in my view, I think a lot can be done by the SAP by way of lowering the interest cost of debt um, that government is actually bearing. And there are various ways of doing this. Number one, as I mentioned before, all you have to do is to look at your projected nominal GDP growth rate and therefore um, work the financial markets in such a way that the long-term interest rates go down to a point where it's sustainable for, for government to fund um, a, a, a fiscal policy to stabilize debt. And secondly, under these conditions, we know that government will be running a deficit and that is going to drive debt up. If we are concerned about that, then there needs to be a space open for monetary financing of that deficit. Because to just allow that fiscal deficit to be opened and for government to go straight to financial markets um, at these high interest rates would be too, too costly for the taxpayer. So we've got uh, innovative, innovative ways of um, basically funding a, a, a government. But just to, to conclude, uh, I just want to say that the Reserve Bank can also, um, like I said, there's a, a broad field of credit, um, of credit action that the Reserve Bank can do. Uh, things that can, could also lift the burden on government, like uh, the Deputy Minister was talking about the funding of SOEs. You know, uh, uh, the law can be, the act of the Reserve Bank can be changed to allow a, a government guaranteed debt to be accepted as part of assets in the Reserve Bank's balance sheet, thereby improving funding for SOEs, expanding funding to DFIs and, and, and other um, uh, institutions that would drive economic development. No, so, so let me conclude now with uh, two things, uh, to know two things. You know, I always say the apartheid uh, Reserve Bank, its monetary policy mandate, was actually more progressive than, than this Reserve Bank that we have. The apartheid uh, monetary policy mandate says that, let me quote, in the exercise of its powers and the performance of its duties, the bank shall pursue its primary objectives of monetary and balanced economic growth in the Republic. It did not elevate price stability, but it made sure that the Reserve Bank has got a dual mandate and the current Reserve Bank elevates price stability. And it says that price stability is in the interest of, you know, it does not directly put uh, that as part of, um, you know, both uh, targets as equally way in its, in its uh, objectives. So briefly, uh, I will stop there. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, I'll now hand over to our discussants um, and I'll each give them five minutes each before we allow um, the Honorable David Masondo to respond. So we will begin with uh, Dick Forsland. Thank you, Comrade Siko. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just, uh, I should not dwell much about what Professor uh, Malikana spoke about. Just to say that something about this, the illusion of the, that the Reserve Bank is independent, or that it's it's. I'm, if you if you if you read uh, what the deputy governor of the Saab uh, was saying in uh, to Business Day just some three weeks ago, uh, Mr. Kuben Naidu, he spoke about if we were to finance government directly, there would be no pressure on government to manage their costs in any way. He said, and uh, what this what this speaks to is the I would say the dogmatism of the Reserve Bank. Well, firstly, that the Reserve Bank is trying to do fiscal policy, but demand from the Treasury not to speak anything about monetary policy. Secondly, that uh, and that has been clear also in the debate with with the Reserve Bank governor between him and Professor Malikan and others that they have it as a principle not to uh, lend any money or to finance the government debt. It's not an issue as it is in the uh, Reserve Bank Act, where there's an issue of the size of such things, uh, which one year ago was set to about 230 billion rand or something like that. It's a principle. Uh, 
And there you have the ideological element in the policy of the Reserve Bank and of the finance minister. It's a dogmatic principle. You can't do anything when it comes to the loan guarantee scheme, for example, other than through the commercial banks. And in fact, they have even written into this deal that uh, they, they put the treasury as a gar guarantor of the, of the uh, claim on the commercial banks. So we, we could at least theoretically end up in a situation where the, the public purse or the treasury is bailing out the reserve bank, although it's the reserve bank that can control the uh, monetary the size of, of, of money in the economy. So that only to that. But otherwise, I only want to say two things. So, so one uh, is a question to the Honorable Deputy Minister, and I also very much appreciate that he is here today, which I hope he still is, even if his television screen is uh, not there. Uh, so, and that is a question about the project of the Finance Minister and the Treasury when it comes to public sector employment. It seems to me that the public sector unions, they don't even dare to ask this question. They are speaking only about the, this reneging from the third year of the wage deal. But uh, uh, as AIDC, we were, we were supplied with the documents from the Treasury before this wage bargaining, and it was clear there that the total cost, the average total cost to the employer for one uh, public sector employee in December last year, uh, four or five months ago, was about 265,000 rand. Now, whether you, you speak about the cuts that the Treasury is uh, proposing or planning, or if it's sort of just outright cuts, or if it's a more complicated maneuver by lowering the budget ceiling, but really it doesn't matter. Uh, in the February budget, uh, there was a plan to cut the so-called public sector wage bill with, with 160 billion rand over three years, or uh, about 95 billion the first two years. Now, in this supplementary budget, there's an additional plan of cutting 230 billion rand over two years. So we are ending up over 300 billion rand uh, over two years of cuts in the public sector. Uh, so my question to the Honorable Minister is, what size uh, is the Treasury projecting of the public sector after two years? What is your plan for public sector employment? Uh, and I'm sure there's such a plan. Uh, you can't cut uh, over 300 billion rand from the public sector over two years without a drastic cut in public sector employment. You can't do that. I, I, that's my contention. Uh, and I, want, I, I think we, the unions and the public deserve to know what is the plan for cuts in public sector employment over two years and over three years. Please uh, go public with your projections, because I'm sure you have such a, a, a plan or such a calculation. Uh, so that is, uh, that is that point. Uh, my second and last point is the issue of debt and the difficult issue of debt. So I appreciate that the finance minister uh, Mboweni give telling examples in a budget speech. I can understand that so that everybody understands and saying that out of, uh, out of uh, 100, 100, one rand in tax revenue, 21 cents is paid uh, as debt service. But I mean, and that was also in the submission by the Budget Justice Coalition, that there's an element of deception here, which is not so, it doesn't suit the treasury. So when you say that 21 cent of one rand uh, of in tax revenue go to debt service, you should also mention that three to four cents of these 21 cents is going to the public sector. And that is the creditors, the government employee pension fund and the uh, unemployment insurance fund. And uh, for some reason, or for some bizarre reason, the UIF, has uh, accumulated 150 billion rand 
during a long period of mass unemployment. And uh, we appreciate that there should be some 30, 40, I think 40 billion rand as a kind of buffer in the UIF uh, for so-called insurance or actuarial reasons. But there's no reason to sort of to build up such a uh, balloon in the UIF and much more than the 40 billion that has been spoken of of the UIF can be used in this crisis for for low for for low interest uh, ex exceeding sort of increasing the lending uh, to another part of the public sector which is the treasury then you have the GEPF and I know that even the the it was mentioned by the public uh, budget uh, of or the parliament budget office that the former deputy director of the treasury, Michael Sachs, has suggested that the, the GEPF should simply, that, that the contributions of the GEPF, uh, 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 the, the contributions to the GEPF from the treasury of some 80 billion rand per year is not necessary for a period of time. And the reason is that the, the, the pension fund is running with a surplus of about 55 billion rand lately. That is why you can use it for uh, so-called concession, concessionary lending. And to those, uh, I mean, to those on the whole, and we have suggested this from AIDC, that, that such a pension fund or a state pension fund like the GEPF, it should really be a so-called pay-as-you-go scheme. So you are, you are supplying the benefits to the, to the members as you go along. But it has been imposed this fully funded scheme on the, on the GEPF. And I mean, it should be a project over one or two or three years to simply change the legislation. Because, and the public sector uh, members now uh, and the, the, those who are retired, they will experience this now this time because, because of the, their pension funds overinvestment on the stock market. And because of the cutoff date for seeing uh, if the fund is fully funded, it's the 31st of March. This is almost like on the bottom of the decline of the stock market, which That's started to occur, remember. And this will, this will re be reflected in the pensions now. So change the legislation of the pension fund and use it uh, for uh, lending to the government. So we, we need, otherwise the government now is provoking a recession or a depression. Thank you, Dr. Dick. Um, I'll move over to Dr. Duma Kobule. Um, five minutes. Um. Thanks, Siko, for making me a doctor when I'm not one. But um, I just want to share my screen quickly. I, I want to share a few slides on my screen, and I know this is going to It's Dominic Duma. <laughs> Okay, I just want to, I'm trying to share the screen. Just hang on. Um, share screen. Okay, I just want to make a few points um, while I talk. Um, first of all, the Treasury has been going on about this public sector wage bill for so long. And the more they repeat it, the more you think it's a fact. Now, let me give you the facts. The facts are, after the occupation-specific dispensation in 2009-2010, this was a once-off dispensation that government made. It wasn't demanded by labor. Government offered it to the public sector workers. Now, if you start by looking at that time after the occupation-specific dispensation, <coughs> The spending as a percentage of total spending for 10 years has been exactly the same on wage, public sector wages. So you cannot blame the public sector wages for the increase in the debt. That's number one. Number two, I just want to look at the combined monetary and fiscal policy response um, to the, basically, I like this term that the SACP talks about the crisis before the crisis. The crisis before the crisis is that we've had five years of declining GDP per capita. We've also had two recessions in two years. We've got unemployment of 10.8 million people, unemployment rate for black African females of 48% expanded 
49% in the Eastern Cape, 44% um, for Black Africans. And that is the crisis that we're facing right now. And um, the response from the Reserve Bank and National Treasury was not enough to address the crisis before the crisis, let alone the current crisis. So we're talking about 275 basis points cut in, in interest rates, 36 billion rand net spending, and 40 billion by the URF. That wouldn't have been enough to address the previous crisis. The second thing is that I listened to Dick's figures that the, the extent of the austerity, this is the, the figures announced in four, year, four months. 260 billion in the February budget, um, 100 billion rands in the emergency budget, and 250 billion rands for the next three years, for the two years after this year. So that is austerity of 600 billion rand, which is going to tip the country into a deeper depression and three years of declining GDP. And guess what, the, what that results in? It results in 50% unemployment and a higher debt to GDP ratio. So the fiscally responsible thing, what Treasury is doing is the fiscally irresponsible thing. And, and so I just want to say something that we, ha we will have no option right now except to implement a basic income grant. Because at that point, when you're talking about 50% unemployment, um, the whole society becomes completely unviable. I just want to share my slides. This is a little bit, so I find, Mr. Dr. Masondo, you say you have no power, but the Treasury regulates the three most important sources of financing for a proper stimulus. Number one is the Saab, as Chris said. Number two is the PIC. And number three is the institutional funds. So I don't understand how you can say that you have no power. I just want to say a little bit running out of time. I just, these are the assets of the PIC in December. They had government debt of 500 billion, public enterprise debt of 200 billion. And then this is my estimate of the size of the assets after the decline of the stock market. So we're talking about 1.9 trillion. At that level, it is still fully funded according to my estimate. And the interesting thing here, um, I've been talking to the URF um, quite a lot. And my estimate after the crisis was correct in terms of the UIF's assets, which is 150 billion. I just have to mention one point. The UIF was completely unaffected by the, the decline in the stock market because most of its investments are in bonds. Now, I just, this is the national balance sheet. Look at the assets. The PIC, 1.9 trillion. The Forex reserves, 900 billion. Can perhaps the deputy minister explain why we can't use half of those forex reserves? Because that covers eight months of imports. And um, why can't we use that as well before we even talk about printing money? Um, and the UFF surplus, which is um, part of the PIC, 150 billion rands, which will reduce to 110 billion rands. And um, this is the PIC scenario that I put, the, the one that, Mike, um, that Dick was talking about. I don't know if you can see total contributions. The total contributions is about 80 billion rands. This thing is fully funded. The majority of public sector pension funds in the world are not fully funded. Most of them are not funded at all, and most of them partially funded. Now, because many people are scared, I used an assumption of 50% investment income. So if, if, we, if we cut 50% of the assets of the PIC, and um, this is the situation, it has a surplus of 15 billion rands a year. So what I'm trying to say is that there's no shortage of proposals on how to finance a stimulus in South Africa. There is so many proposals out there. Treasury is just tone deaf towards all of them. And then, so th what I'm trying to say is that we've got the Reserve Bank in terms of financing our, um, I believe that this debt of 760 billion rands, the Saab and the PIC must go together and start working how they can help the government in funding this thing. And also the foreign exchange reserves, um, they can recapitalize, as Chris was saying, and um, the DFIs, we can have developmental windows, we can have monetary financing. Um, the PIC, as I said, they can write off the state debt of 500 billion rands. They can write off the state-owned enterprise debt of 200 billion rands. 
and they can use cash of 140 billion rand to fund the fiscal stimulus, and there will still be 50% funding in the PIC for them to have an annual surplus every year in terms of their operations. And then I believe that we need an um, investment for growth accord. There's nine trillion rands of these assets. No South African in their right mind can give me a reason why we can't have a portion of these assets in impact or developmental investments. So let me just quickly show you. So this is a little bit of a scenario which I can explain some other day, not today, that there is so much we can do with the balance sheet of the government that does, none of it has touched existing spending of the government. And we can release a trillion rand that Matthew Parks was talking about without even printing money. That's what I'm trying to show. Thank you so much. Thank you, Duma Kabule. Um, it's Dominic's fault, the reason um, why you were um, called a doctor, but it's never too late to advance your studies. <laughs> um, I'll hand over to Reg um, as our final discussant, and then I'll give an opportunity to the minister for about 10 minutes to 15 minutes to respond after Reg. Thanks, uh, Siko, and uh, panelists and uh, fellow discussants. Well, almost the entire budget issue has been uh, exhausted, really. I don't think there's much that one can add on there. Views have been expressed, which are, are quite sound. Uh, those opposing the minister, uh, my colleagues there, are quite, quite, they stand on very sound uh, ground. But mine is not really going to be about the numbers and the mechanics thereof. Mine is about the economics or the logic, if you want, that gives rise to the budgets, not this current budget alone, but the budgets that we've been having for so many years that have given us the mess we sit in today. So it's basically the economics that informs this, uh, the budget. And it doesn't really matter whether we tweak here today and tweak there tomorrow for as long as the underpinning economics is wrong. We will never succeed. So here it is here, Dr. Masondo. If this budget was to be presented in 1950s, 1960s, it would be a perfect budget. It would be a very, very perfect budget in the sense that you have located the thinking as if it is in the gold standard era, where governments were, governments were restricted in terms of how to play around the monetary as well as the fiscal uh, 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 policies. It's indeed what we actually call a microeconomic budget, when what you're dealing with are macroeconomic issues. And such issue, you cannot do that. A household budget that talks to you having to get money that you earn and spending less or more of it is not how government budget works. It's not how state budgets work. And to the extent that you continue to work the budget in this particular manner, we can forget for another 100 years until someone comes and changes the mechanics of our, or the economics that underpin it. Here's the issue. <clears throat> you first say start with the, the debt is quite high. Of course it is high. It has to be high because your economics says that as soon as there is a deficit, all you have to do is to go and borrow money on the capital market, right? The question is, why do you have to go on the capital market? Because your economics says we don't have savings in this country, all right? And that economics is wrong. So, and also it says that capital markets, you know, there's competition there and there's so on and so forth. So you trust capital markets more than non-capital markets. But frankly, that's not correct. One of the reasons why you quickly jump onto the capital market is because the International Monetary Fund and the IMF, sorry, the 
and the World Bank are the institutions behind this particular framework, which is an imprisoning framework indeed. The IMF, the World Bank, and a few other institutions basically dictate that you should be going into the capital market and borrowing money from there. But what you have not understood are the economics of the capital market itself. <coughs> You'll be surprised to know that advanced nations in Europe do not have as deep the capital markets as South Africa, yet those are powerful countries. For example, Germany. You would as well think you are in Germany. The capital market system here would as well be that of Germany. But Germany was, until recently, the third largest economy on earth. It wasn't using the so-called capital markets in the manner we use it. So the logic of economics of saying we don't have uh, savings is actually wrong. It comes from the old understanding of economics that uh, is long discarded. In fact, it is, as I said, the gold standard era type of thinking. So yes, uh, today you, you, you sit with uh, a very high debt and you want to begin to restructure it here and there. It's not gonna work. It doesn't matter whether you use PIC funds. You wanna exhaust PIC funds at some point in time. You wanna exhaust all the other funds together because what you're trying to, to do is to use a microeconomic approach when solving a fundamentally macroeconomic issue of growth, debt, and so on. Now, if I were perhaps to go further, because uh, I don't have uh, many minutes, perhaps I'll uh, have to return to these issues uh, uh, later on, is uh, <clears throat> uh, the issue that Professor Maricani talked to. But just before that, you know, you say we have to find cheap money, go to the IMF, and so on. Again, there's absolutely no reason for South Africa to go to the IMF. Why should any country go and borrow money when that country has the capacity to manufacture money. And after all, even IMF doesn't even manufacture money, all right? It's money contributed by all these member states. So there's no logic, no, there's no economic logic why a country that has the capacity to manufacture money through its reserve bank, through its uh, domestic public banks, should walk away and get indebted with all men of risks that come with uh, a borrowing from abroad, when in fact, there's a very easy way of getting the domestic fi uh, financing. One of it is, even if you had to use one bank, mercantile bank, for example, or Ned Bank, or any one of these, they can actually meet the requirement that government wants. And by the way, if you were to use Ned Bank, they can print any trillion rands if you want. Okay, at what rate would, would NetBank give you? It would give you below prime. It would even give you at repo rate. Yet today, your capital markets, which you, you, know, you continue to, to talk about, will give you at 9%, at 10%. Yet you can easily get this money from a single bank, I repeat, because banks do not need any person's savings to lend. Now, the economics which says, well, banks do not require uh, savings and then pass on those savings to government is old economics that should not, in fact, be what we should be doing today. In fact, many countries have actually run, run away from that. I'm sure uh, Dr. Masonde, you would have read recently, even the governor did quote one paper from the Reserve Bank of England, where they rejected the notion that savings are central to this. But before having to, uh, having to consume all my time, I perhaps have to go to, to, to Professor Malikani's inputs. Uh, Professor Malikani reflected on the issue of the interest rate policy. Once again, Dr. Masondo and colleagues, the so-called monetary policy that we have here is not in fact what supposed to be called monetary policy. It is correctly the interest rate policy. The interest, pol interest rate policy is intended to be a stabilizing tool, not a growth tool. 
There's nowhere in economics or in macroeconomics where they say interest rate is a key macroeconomic variable. It's not, it has never been. And to use this particular policy, interest rate policy for a developing country is quite frankly to tell the country that we don't understand macroeconomics. Therefore, all this budgeting comes from that poor understanding of macroeconomics and we we'll continue to do this. It doesn't matter how much we tweak all the numbers. We're going to continue to suffer for the rest of for the generations. All of us are going to die. South Africa will continue to be poor. There's not a single country, whether it's the US, whether it's Japan, whether it's Germany, and the recently de developed developing countries that ever use this particular tool. Again, Professor Malikani, if I were just to, 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 to inter interject. The mandate of the Reserve Bank of Japan was to provide money to the economy of Japan. The stabilization element of it came second. The Reserve Bank provides money for development, that's developing Japan, and the same Reserve Bank ensures that the money it has provided to government is stabilized. So the price stability comes after the government, I mean, the, the bank has provided that money. So that should have been demanded of many, many other uh, 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 countries in Africa. But the same type of mandate was available in Germany, if you, if you remember. The entire German economy from 1930s was based on the real monetary policy, not the interest rate policy. All the advanced economies, like I said, the, the recently advanced developing countries like South Korea and so on, never use the interest rate policy. So we are therefore trapped in the economics that is not going to help us. It doesn't matter how much we shift the numbers in our budgets. It doesn't matter what we do with that. So indeed, uh, Professor Malikani, it's important therefore that uh, the interest rate policy should be discarded, that the governor continues to tell us about, you know, interest rate is this and that and that. It's a complete waste of time. Until we begin to shift, we have a problem. The monetary and fiscal coordination comes also to be a very important issue. I hope I'm not uh, over my time there. You are. Uh, why is it so Sorry? You are over time, Rich. Why? Is okay, all right, let me finish in the, in the next uh, minute or two. No Why is it so important to have this monetary and, uh, and, and, and fiscal coordination? It's so vital that the workings of the Reserve Bank must necessarily tie with the workings of, the, of, uh, of, uh, of Treasury. Because in macroeconomics, you cannot separate money and fiscal, uh, monetary and, 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 and fiscal, you can't. But the institutions that came to compartmentalize government are the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and they injected that spirit into the Department of Finance. And the Department of Finance finds it fit to have one arm doing things on its own, another on its own. Therefore, the breakdown of the issues that we find ourselves with in, the, in this country. But to the extent that we continue to labor under this particular framework, and I hope I'll be given a chance as a bit later to present an alternative framework. And unless we begin to move away from this defunct framework, it doesn't matter whether you bring in PIC, you bring in you know, IMF and so on and so forth. It's a lost game. I'll return a bit later. Thank you, Rich. Um, Honorable Minister Masondo, um, I can't see if your video is on. Okay. Um, do you want to proceed and answer or do you want me to re-highlight some of the questions? No, let me try to, just in the interest of time, because I see we left it almost 30 minutes. Um, just to start with Busi, Busi, right, we could have done more in terms of the allocations uh, not only on the gender-based violence budget, we could have done more on many other 
budget uh, items. Um, but at the time when we were putting this budget together, we worked with what we had. We didn't work on the basis of what may come from the, uh, the Reserve Bank or the tax or any other alternative mode of financing of generating revenue from government. We worked on this and therefore this is what um, we could basically produce. And I take your point about the loan guarantee scheme. Uh, there are challenges there and we are attending to them because the uptake has been very low and there have been different submissions uh, by different organizations in which they are critiquing the scheme itself and making certain uh, suggestions in so far as the scheme is concerned. The zero based budgeting, <clears throat> you're right. What, what, for me, what will get prioritized? It will be a function of the balance of power, the struggle on what's important, what needs to be uh, prioritized in so far as our budget is concerned because the budget is not just a technical process. It's also a function of uh, struggles in society, within, amongst ourselves, even in... So you're right that uh, the fact that you've said zero-based budgeting does not follow that you will um, deal with or allocate the money in such a way that produce developmental outcomes. I mean, this is a function of uh, struggle because, and, and the debate around austerity versus non-austerity is a useful one, but you've got to go into, if you're not going austere, um, increasing expenditure, what do you want to increase the money on? And I think that's a conversation that we should basically have because sometimes we get locked into, is it austerity or not austerity? I do think that we need to move beyond, um, if we are to prioritize, what are the things that we need to prioritize on? Is it SOEs? Even if we get the money from other alternatives that uh, uh, my fellow Pelonists have basically indicated, we, we need to come back to that question on um, where do we spend this money on? And in my view, it's important to focus on industrialization, agriculture, infrastructure, not to say other social expenditure are, imp are not important. I shouldn't be that uh, to be saying that at all. And I think uh, uh, Professor Malikane has covered me in so far as the idea that uh, the Reserve Bank, there's no general independence of the Reserve Bank. It's a myth. You guys who are studying monetary economists, you uh, independence of the Reserve Bank has a special meaning. In monetary economies, you distinguish between goal independence as well as the instrument independence. And the goal of the um, Reserve Bank has been set in the constitution and as government, we further take it down and say, okay, what does it mean um, in so far as the um, goal of the independence. And it's for this reason that National Treasury uh, did not, because the target for the uh, inflation is not set in the constitution. Someone must set it. And then we've set it as, as, as government, which is between three uh, to six percent. Uh, should we be setting other goals insofar as this? I think it's a matter that we need to uh, basically uh, discuss. And all I was saying, insofar as the independence is concerned, is that uh, National Treasury um, cannot uh, force um, the Reserve Bank insofar as the way in which they exercise the instruments at their disposal. That, that's a simple point I was basically making. Is there coordination? Are there discussions? Of course there are uh, uh, between ourselves as well as the uh, Reserve Bank. And I would have 
And again, this also brings me back to the issue about the, I mean, maybe it's the organizers. It's my uh, little squabble with the organizer that it could have been nice to have invited uh, colleagues from the Reserve Bank themselves to come and have conversations uh, with you insofar as these issues are concerned. Um, the public sector wage bill, Dick, I think the matter now is going to court the wage, uh, um, the, one, the way in which we're trying to reduce the public debt and, look, and, and considering the wage settlement that we signed with labor in 2018. And that's a matter that I will not want to comment in detail unless these issues can be used also in parliament. And I think I'm not in parliament, in court. So I, I wouldn't want to comment too much insofar as the wage bill is concerned. All I've been advised um, is that we, the, the, the wage bill, it's high to the extent that it's also becoming difficult for government to employ more workers into the public service. The UIF matter, UIF is able to generate revenue or money itself because government is able to pay back those uh, uh, the, the money that we borrow from the, uh, through buying the bonds, I mean, through selling the bonds, which are, uh, 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 are bought by institutional investors, including the PIC, we are able to pay back the UIF money precisely because, um, I mean, the UIF is able to continue to have this money precisely because they are able, we are able to pay back as government. But if we reach a point where we are not able to honor the debt, which also comes from the institutional investors, UIF money also included. I do think that uh, we will be in trouble, not only uh, ourselves, but this worker's money. And I think the issue around the G, the pension money, and again here, yeah, the PIC, as you know better than I do, they get a mandate from the GPF. They are a client. Uh, they get the mandate from, they don't invest on the basis of the instruction from National Treasury, they invest on the basis of the mandate from the GEPF. I mean, if you take, for instance, the ongoing debate or discussion now on whether the loan that was advanced to ESCOM should be turned into equity. The GPF, GEPF, they ask, will that instrument by turning the um, loan into debt, I mean, into equity, will that generate returns for the GPF itself? Because at the current moment, because this is a loan advanced to ESCOM, GPF through the asset manager, PIC, they are able to generate income through interest payment that is paid by uh, ESCOM. Now, if you say that they must turn that into equity, if you are equity, as you know better than I do, is that you now have to earn your returns through um, dividends. And that speaks to the, fun the, the, the operational uh, efficiency of uh, ESCOM, will ESCOM be in a position to generate revenue in order to sustain itself as well so that it can pay dividends to equity or shareholders? In this instance, part of them is the GPEF. And therefore, we, we cannot, for instance, talk about just turning debt into equity without speaking to the question about how do we make um, ESCOM operationally efficient, generating revenue in order for race, and including dealing with the cost structure and some of the sources of the cost structure, they arise from the 
primary sources of energy, coal, and so forth and so forth. So, and we are in conversations, for instance, uh, with the primary sources uh, of energy suppliers, coal miners, and all that, just to make sure that we look at the price of coal in order to improve the operational efficiency. Because if we just throw money and not really look at the operational efficiencies, and it comes back, goes back to the point that I, I made earlier on, that we do need to distinguish the symptom because for us, that it's a symptom of a number of things. And in this instance, ESCOM said, the debt arose as a consequence of, amongst other things, the Medupi Kusile project, which had a lot of overruns. And we can get into that, into why they were cause overruns and all that. But we've got to deal with some of the uh, underlying issues in some of those uh, SOEs. And there's no doubt that uh, we need to think about different ways of financing our economic uh, uh, reconstruction. Um, and insofar as the role of the um, National Treasury, I just, the, the criticism I get, and, and maybe one should distinguish it in terms of whether there's a will or whether there are limits, objective limits. And, and that's a conversation that we need to have. Um, the last, no, it's not the last point because there's a lot of questions that we ask. I think the ESCOM issue, I've tried to answer it. You know, the minister in the budget, in the, during the interviews, after the presentation of the budget, um, he said that it, there's one part of my speech which was omitted. And that had to do with the regulation 28. And I must start by saying that the intention here, it's not to uh, force investments that are not going to generate returns for the uh, workers. It's not intended to force this investment to be invested in uh, assets that A, are not going to be growth enhancing and B, are not going to generate returns for the people who are going to retire. And it doesn't matter whether it's a pay as you go or whatever model, but the bottom line is that you've got to invest this retirement funds in a responsible manner. So what the thinking here was that is that we need to read, look at regulation 28 in such a manner that enables uh, asset managers to invest in infrastructure assets. Because at the moment, if you look at the immovable properties, which are properties which are largely related to the private consumption, the way, be it housing or business um, uh, assets like malls and all that, the issue around infrastructure assets it's being, it's not uh, included in that regard. And the conversation or the intention is that we need to broaden that to include the investment, I mean, infrastructure uh, assets. I, I just want to disagree a little bit with uh, Reggie here that I do not think that, uh, and I'm, you'll correct me if I misunderstand you. Um, I, I do not think that um, the issue about gold standards, including which enabled the Great Depression, was a constraint in so far as a central bank then to have not chosen what the central bank of the United States in 2008 during the global economic crisis should have done. In other words, they could have deployed, in my view, quantitative easing. It was a choice they made. They could have abandoned the gold standard. Britain had already done it. So there was no 
there was nothing written in law which said that thou shall be bound by the gold standard. It's a choice they decided to make. Um, and, and therefore, those are the choices that they basically uh, made at that uh, particular time. And, and I would have liked to hear, and, and, and I mean, I got the point that you would, have, you would have wanted more time to present different alternatives insofar as the financing is concerned. Um, unfortunately, you didn't have time, but it would be interesting to hear what you think the alternatives are, because that's the purpose of this ongoing conversation that we basically have. The second point that I want to disagree with you on, you, and, and please, if I'm misunderstanding you, you'll correct me, because I don't like to caricature people's argument and build straw men and, 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 and attack uh, and criticize people on the basis of an incomplete um, mis or misunderstanding. You know, if, 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 if I've, I'm going to say this, it's not out of the attempt to caricature your argument. But I don't think that to say that uh, interest rates is just for stabilization, it's not for developmental purposes. I, I think I'll disagree with you there because. If interest rates are low, for instance, you're reducing the cost of borrowing, both of capital as well as labor and improving its capacity to spend on wage goods. I mean, if interest rates are low, not only for government, but also for business, it means that they will be able to borrow more money and then deploy it for uh, investment and grow the economy and thus increasing the demand for capital goods, which are necessary for capital accumulation, for, cap for, for economic growth. The interest rates are low. Um, the wage goods, uh, including housing and all that, you bo you're boosting aggregate demand in so far as that is concerned. So I do not think that uh, you can present the issue of the interest rate as just the issue about stabilization. I do think that if you, re I mean, the. You, and a new reading of the South Korea, I do not think it's correct because they did use the interest rate as developmental instruments. And I rely largely here on Hang, I don't know if I'm pronouncing Hang Chang. If, if I, I mean, he's a, a developmental economist, if I'm not mistaken, still based in Cambridge, who basically demonstrate how interest rates were basically used as a developmental instrument, not just as something for uh, stabilization. Um, so I, 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 I sort of part company with you in many respects in so far as these uh, issues are concerned. And I, like I said, um, if, if I've misunderstood you, uh, that is not the intention, but that's how I heard you. And this is a feedback that I'm giving you in so far as this is, these issues are concerned. Um, so, I mean, let, let me end it here um, because we left with uh, eight uh, minutes, but the conversations must uh, go on and, and particularly as government is thinking about the, the third phase of this uh, economic uh, reconstruction in this era of uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, and its impact on the economy. And I fully agree with you that um, even before COVID, we had a huge economic problem, economic crisis that require us to think hard about uh, alternatives, uh, including thinking about unconventional interventions that we need to make in our economy, including the financing of the economic I mean, reconstruction in this era of uh, COVID. I don't want to talk about the post lockdown, post COVID. I think it's better to frame it as uh, economic reconstruction in the era of uh, COVID uh, because I'm, I'm not a medical expert, but uh, the understanding is that we're going to have COVID for a long time. So that as we think about this alternative, we don't think about 
in a way, uh, a war in which, okay, once the war is over, then we'll start with the reconstruction because the virus will still be with us in many respects. And uh, what we do today will also prefigure how we intend to uh, reconstruct. So it can be, we can have a mechanical uh, distinction between what we do today in uh, thinking about the future because what we do today will, is it prefigures what we intending to do in future insofar as the economic reconstruction is concerned. Let me end it here, Siko. Um, you will guide me on what to do. I'm under your dictatorship. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, um, Honorable Minister David Masondo. And a big thank you as well to our panelists um, and our discussants and our participants. I just want to highlight that just going through the question and answer, there's a lot of questions. And just uh, there's, there's a couple of themes that have been coming up. And that's the question of a wealth tax, the question of increasing the tax on corporates, and also what it means when we speak about spending or investing in productive infrastructure, Minister, and, and, and also basically unpacking what it means to have a growth enhancing investment. And finally, as you also mentioned, what are the alternatives, as also mentioned by Reg, what is an alternative macroeconomic framework which is certainly needed and there is also a further engagement that's needed with your colleagues minister such as um, uh, from the reserve bank and with that i just want to say once again thank you um, for honoring the invitation minister um, and for engaging with um, civil society this is something that should um, be informing your decisions as well in the future and we hope that we will continue um, engaging as well in future. And I'd just like to thank everybody for joining us and we'll be closing the session. And, and perhaps next time we can pick up once again with the unresolved questions in another debate. And thank you to AIDC for co-hosting with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and to the Mail and Garden as well. So I guess we'll close it. Um,